as if you steal my brain Fry it up a little, put it back again You wear my love like it's a crown Like something that you want You can show it off and put it down To know, does the train stop here? Or are you headed to a new frontier? Because you got me in limbo. Welcome again to the Strange Brew Podcast. My name's Jason Barnard and that was John Rhino Edwards and Limbo from his Just Saying EP, a taster of his forthcoming Just Saying album. John is well known as being status quo's long-time bassist as well as songwriter, but his work is even much broader than that. We'll be covering uh, his timing at the prog rock band Rococo, time with Judy Zook, Dex's Midnight Runners, as well as his solo project, Rhino's Revenge. So let's hear my chat with Rhino. Ah, hello. Hello. Tell us about your new album, Just Saying. Well, it was going to be under my um my Rhino's Revenge name, but I decided that's quite a sort of, yeah, rock and roll, baby. And as I'm 70 and I've got a hernia, I didn't really feel that it was um the right kind of thing to be doing. So I've changed it to John Rhino Edwards for a start. There'll be um, a pre-order button on rhinosrevenge.com for albums and vinyl, CDs and vinyl. It'll be out before Christmas. But in the meantime, we are putting out the Just Saying EP, and that consists of four brand new ditties. I'm really, really liking, you know, I mean, it's, um, that's it. the other reason I put it out in my own name is um, the albums I've done before have had um, not a theme running through them. I mean, I'd 
I don't know if you're familiar with my work, but um, yeah. the last one I had, um, I had a bit of rap on it, um, you know, and a bit of um, sort of metal. But it, it was very much in the uh, in the rock idiom, if you like. And this new one is really quite eclectic. There's lots of different styles on it and lots of different musings, which is why I've called it just saying it's my um, thoughts on various things from to how to grow old disgracefully to a few rants about issues of the day. One of them being that, you know, I think as you get older, well, you don't seem to have much of a voice. And there's songs about, you know, you're never too old to rock and roll, which is a good and a bad thing, I think, because if, if you're looking for reviews, if you like, you're a bit stymied for magazines. Although I have just done an interview with Caravan magazine, because I've also written a song about how I love my caravan. And I've got, a, I've, I actually do have a caravan. I've had one for 30 years. And um, I wrote this song and I love it. I think it's great. It's great fun. I've got four tracks on the, the EP, The PC Worlds. I've got My Side of the Road, which is a real proper shuffle, kind of query shuffle. But um, it's the first track, but I'm not playing bass on it. Someone else is playing bass on it. Interested to hear someone else playing one of my songs. I've got another one called Can't Count Me Out, which is basically an homage to The Who, Young Man Blues kind of era, quite my generation lyrics, although the older generation lyrics. And uh, the fourth one is called Limbo which is a very interesting song. I think it's just about being in limbo in a relationship, which I'm not, but um, I put myself in a situation of somebody who doesn't really know what's going on. It's actually about someone who was just getting messed around by someone. Hey, I love them all. I've been much more um, careful about my vocal style because I appreciate that my vocal is very much an acquired taste. I would have always had a, another singer, but Mike Paxman, who I've worked with on all of these albums, he just said, you can't. They're you. They're your songs. You know, no one's going to sing them how you want them. Mike Paxman has been, he's just been incredible on this record. I brought the songs along. If you like, almost like an analogy, I put up the easel and the, um, and the outline of the song, and then he got his palette out. He's just put the most incredible colours on it. What's it like uh, writing with Francis? Because you mentioned Can't Count Me Out. He's got a, a real ability, Francis, with me. I call it going into a room. And he will send me bits and bobs that he's done that he thinks will, I will sort of go, yeah. And it, and it's what he does. He makes me go into it, and I'm being arty here, whatever, but he makes me go into a room that I wouldn't necessarily have visited, if you see what I mean. Yeah. On the um, I was writing, oh, you know, I've been in that room. Oh, my God, look what's happening in here. And um, we sort of work it in different ways. It, it's very rarely together. The last song we wrote together was a song called Beginning of the End. That was when we, the last time we actually wrote together. But normally it's like like I write with Andrew Bound. He'll give me an idea or vice versa. And he'll, we'll back it back and forth. And of course, with the internet, you know, you can just send, send over stuff as you think of it. And Can't Count Me Out was exactly that. You know, Francis came up with this whole kind of hooey, yeah, can't explain kind of vibe. And I just took it on from there. That, that was probably more me than him in that but there's another one we've done called, on the album called tried and tested which i'm going to do as a duet and uh, in my first duet on this album that yeah that that was more he sent me he sent me quite a lot quite a chunk of the song already done and i you know he did the inspiration i did the perspiration
the point of view? What is what and who is who? What exactly is it that you do? On live dates, playing a few uh, some of the new material, and, and I know that in the past you've played um, a few songs that you've wrote that were featured in Quo. Like, uh, was it Two Way Traffic? Is a bit of a favourite, isn't it? Yeah, I love the song. That song I always thought was Quo with a bit of a modern twist on it. I thought it sounded like how we should like status quo, but with a bit more of a of a punky edge to it, if you like. But I think it was a bit fast for some people. Francis couldn't keep up with the singing. I do some Quo stuff, which is um. As it's stuff that I've written for Status Quo, it's mainly quite obscure. Um, some songs I wrote with Rick Parfit, which I really like. Then uh, we do Paper Plane. I do it because I like I like it. I mean, it's one. It was one of my favourite songs anyway, like proper favourite. And uh, yeah, I'm in the best band I could possibly be in. I've enjoyed my stint with Quo so much.
Andy Fraser, he was one of your influences, wasn't he? Andy Fraser, my all-time, my all-time favourite bass player, pre. They did a song called Mr. Big. I'm playing with another band that is, um, I don't know how you are with facts on the wax, but it's a singer from a band called Backstreet Crawler, ah. which Paul Kossoff formed when he left free. And I'm playing, I'm playing with a singer from um, Backstreet Crawler, Terry, who's incredible. But we do Mr. Big sometimes, and I try to learn the solo. Well, I did learn took me three days because it's so it's variations on this incredibly slim but amazing theme and if they said it was 18 he probably just peeled it off but that's the reason why i play bass richmond athletic ground seven of them 1969 seven and six to get in three groundhogs joanne kelly bit marvel and the thunderbolts and i used to play guitar and violin's my first instrument right i just walked in there and i walked out bass player a real epiphany. I know what I want to do. That's it. I want to be a bass player. I used to follow three. They blew me away every time. They were Im- amazing. Paul Rogers opened for Status Quo on a tour. I just couldn't talk to him. You're Paul Rogers, and you're supporting me. Like, this this is weird. But he's a very nice bloke. Plucked up the courage to get him to sign my free story CD. Yeah, top man. The drummer who was playing with me for a while was playing with Paul Rogers as well. And Save the Rhino is my chosen charity. We always have a collection bucket. And and then every so often I'll sell, if anybody's interested, by the way, I sell, I sell my gold discs, upwards of £600 for charity. And it all just goes to Save the Rhino. But when he heard I was doing that, he sent me an amazing letter. And he said, I really think that's a great thing you're doing. And he sent me a load of, a load of signs, DVDs and CDs. That if you can sell these at your gigs, you know, I'd like to help. If I can help out, Paul Rogers. <laughs> So yeah, save the rhino. We we do quite a bit for them, as I would.
In the 70s, you featured on a wide range of music, including um, stuff that was a bit more progressive, like, uh, is it Rococo? Because I've, I've heard a track called The Living Rock, with a bit sort of Genesis feel. Yeah, cut out of The Living Rock, yeah, going to be hard oh, till the living stops. Yeah, ba 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 bloody hell. Bizarrely, I was talking about Rococo the other day to somebody, and in about 74, 75, Melody Maker, they had like a battle of the bands, I can't think what it was called, but a nationwide one. And we got to the final. We'd called ourselves the Brats because we were so vague. We thought, we don't want people to know we're doing this because we were Coco. Never did jack shit. Had one deal we for one single. And uh, we put out an advert in the manager and it said, the Brats with 11 support bands. We were never going to win. And that's the year that the mighty Druid won it. <laughs> Druid, yeah. Right on, man, you know, far out. <laughs> and I played um, wearing a spacesuit. I played wearing dungarees. Kim Wilde asked me to dye my hair black. I've worn a lot of uniforms in my career. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, with, with Quo, it's a bit of a uniform, but I, I get it. Whatever makes the music come across better is what's necessary.
I also love the music that you made with uh, Judy Zukam. Heaven Can Wait from Shoot the Moon. The bass playing on that, again, it's got more of that jazz fusion edge. It's really weird. I've always loved rock music and blues music, but I'm really keen on Frank Zappa, really, really keen. And um, I was really into the fusion thing. I was really into the Mavish, the orchestra and Return to Forever and Weather Report. I really, really got into them. And I, and I went to see I went to see Weather Report with Jacko playing with them. I mean, that was pretty mind blowing. That was one take. That was. I remember doing it so well. Again, I'm afraid. Yeah, and it's it's like um like an angry angry bird fluttering around. Quite a bit of empathy on that, you know. Yeah, I was very very a song on there called "Liquors at Your Funeral," where I played the bass with a really heavily rosin cello bow. Really weird noises. I still really, yeah, I really like that album. Playing with Shuddy was a great era because if your album didn't sell, we're in it for the art. That's why I'm doing my album. I'm doing it because I want to, and it's me. You will, if you listen to it, you'll leave with a smile on your face. There's a few toe tappers, and there's a, there's a few, there's a couple of songs that are really quite contentious, which is why I call it Just Saying. There's one, yeah, I, there's a song called The PC World, which is on my EP, and that that will um, hopefully ruffle a couple of feathers. A lot, I don't mind an argument.
what was it like in Dex's Midnight Runners? Brilliant, brilliant. Loved it. Every second of it. We used to have to run into the theatres because they were so big at the time. I used to walk so I'd get mobbed. <laughs> no, it, it was just great. We, we, uh, I got to, um, I did Saturday Night Live, which was great. We did two tours of America when I was there. And the first tour brought more people than, than after coming on and got to number one. Because I think the Dexys had a real cult following. I saw the best gig I ever saw there, which was James Brown, at the Beacon Theatre in New York, supported by Etta James. Wow. You know, I was just standing at the back and Kevin was going, well, to be honest, he said, when I saw him in 75, they were incredible. He said, that was all right. But, I mean, I saw it. Wow. It just blew my mind. It really did. I didn't think it was going to be very good. And it was just so tight. A proper show, but with a bit of... um. With a lot of attitude, and, and you know, and James Brown, his career was in the doldrums at the time. It was before living in America, and um, so he had to really go for it. Oh, he went for it. I mean, it was amazing. Anyway, yeah, best gig I've ever been to by quite even better than Frank Zappa. Although I saw Zappa quite a few times. Zappa's concerts always had the best sound since the last Zappa concert I've been to. Do you remember recording "Don't Stand Me Down" by Dexys? Yeah, I mean. I was asked if I could do a rehearsal, and I couldn't because I was going on tour with the Climax Blues Band. So that, with Dexys, if you can't do something, you're out. You know, that's that. I understood that. And um, about three months later, the phone rings, and it's Helen. Hello, hello Helen, how are you? And um, she said, great. Um, we're at Westside Studios. I said, oh, yeah. I said, oh, what, <laughs> why are you telling me that? And she said, do you know Randy Hope Taylor? who's another bass player. I said, of course I do. You know, I did. And um, she said, right, okay. Are you busy at the moment? I said, no, no. She said, well, can you come to Westside Studios, but wait for us to come and get you? As in, if you see Randy, please hide. So I saw Randy, I'm in my car, I see Randy coming out, so I'm like sliding down under the thing, and you know, yeah, see you, Randy, nice to meet you and all that, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, they, then I get, come on, come on. They, and they, they'd already wiped him by the time I got in there. They used so many, they tried so many different musicians, like the Motown thing, but... um. Yeah, this is what she'd like. It's me on there. And um, oh, I redid the bass. What I'd done, I'd done the original backing track and they'd wipe me and put Randy on. Because back in the day, it was analog, so they didn't keep what I'd done. And actually, they realised that what I'd done was better. And then I came in and I, and I redid it. So I, I did this two-bar section for about two hours. And at the end, what do you think? Yeah, Kevin, that's it. That's the one. And um, I said, oh, great, okay. So they went out. The engineer said, I kept the second take. But for what it's worth, I won't have a bad word said again about Kevin Rowland. I have nothing but respect for him. I, I think he's a true artist. At the most amazing time. I don't like this. May I speak to you now?
really wealthy peasants, you know, with your home bars and you know, the high fives and all that stuff. You know? yeah. You'd either use words like fabulous, you know, super, and every sentence they spit out. You know? Yeah. Um, well, I really like these scumbags. And your favourite songs to play live with Quo? Oh, wow. I really like playing Rain. Uh-huh. Again, because well, because of Rick, you know, um, I always really liked the song. We, we There was talk of not doing it when he went. It was before Richie started singing more. And I, I really said, no, 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 no. That's not happening. We're doing Rain and I'm singing it. And that's all there is to it. You know, I'm not having that song disappear. Maybe I don't do it justice, I don't know, but I'm telling you, when I sing it every night, it's from the heart. So that's, I pay for playing. There's so many, I mean, in the army now, you know, as a, as a great thing for me, because it was the song, it was the first song, the first album I did when I joined the band. And it is actually, by the way, the band's biggest selling single ever. You know, everyone thinks it's rocking over the world. It's not, it's in the army now. I like Hold You Back to play very much. I like, yeah, the beginning of the end, I like. What was it like writing with Rick? Because a very different personality. Oh, yeah, different with Rick. I did most of the writing, truth be told. Mm. But it doesn't matter at all, because then I would we did a song called Creeping Up, Creeping Up on You, and I, and I sort of come up with a lot of it. But bizarrely, Creeping Up was a title. He said something about him. He said, I'm creeping up. And I, thought, and I said to him, OK, that's our next song. I kind of said, oh, I was creeping up, and he kept saying I was creeping up. So that's good. And the other one, he said to me, um, we wrote a song called Obstruction Day. And we were stuck in traffic. He said, what a fucking Obstruction Day. And I said to him again, that's our next song. I mean, I wrote Bella Vista Man, pretty much all of it. Yeah, I did. It's on um, The Party Ain't Over Yet. Obstruction Day, is. I, I really like that. That's quite... A, that's a, another one I like playing on my gigs. We would write sitting looking at each other. And then basically he would come up with 20 ideas and luckily I used to record them because the first one was always the best. But I knew Rick well enough to write a song about him. And there's a song, again, on that album, there's a song called This Is Me, but it's all about him. But I wrote the lyric. But you wouldn't know it because it's very autobiographical. But, you know, we were very, very, very close, me and Rick. Yeah, I, you know, I still miss him a lot. I really do. Uh, of all the people I know who died, he's the one I think of the most. You know, I still think about Rick most days. I mean, I think he was possibly bipolar, and now everyone's on the spectrum or whatever. I think he may well have been bipolar. I mean, he's made me weep with laughter. We, we were very, very close for a, for a long time. When he met his third wife, Lindsay, who's very nice, by the way, hmm. I'm not, nothing against, but he changed, you know, and we, we didn't become so close, which, which was very sad, but there you go. You know, life is cyclical, isn't it? Hmm. I've been close with Andrew and Francis for a, lot, a very long time. I mean, it was quite a, um, and it was now the three of us now, you know, but I mean, I'm talking to Francis a lot now. I don't mean that I did not talk to him, but he's quite um, insular, you know. I mean, but that's what I love about being in status quo, it's a very insular band. But Francis, Francis is quite enigmatic, but I think that's great because I think that's the way he, he likes to be. And that's, you know, it's fair enough. You give people room. When you're in a band, it's all about compromise. You've got and you you've got to accept who people are because if you don't, you won't stay together. I opened up 
the paper I was all across the page With another senorita Will I ever act my age I always hurt the people But care for me it's true But I can't help myself It's just one of those things I do I ain't no Casanova Not like it reads in the book I'm just trying to find this love thing Though it's taking a long, hard look If you need your heart breaking You've come to the been on lead vocals on some quo material because there's bad news for example from uh, in search of the fourth chord works really well again we do that live the great thing about uh, that song as well is that it sounds really fat as a three-piece three it's really hard to write songs at three i love playing in the three-piece band especially when i'm here well no not when i'm in charge isn't the right expression because i ask people to play with me like i've asked leon k from status quo and craig joiner on guitar who are both on the album they're joining me on tour. I've asked them along because I want them to play how they play. That's a really great thing. But it's also in the three piece band, there's a lot of room for everybody. As long as you don't go mad, you can sort of pretty much do what you want to do. 
yeah, I mean, Rhino's Revenge gigs, I have to say, I wouldn't say they're, sh- they're not shambolic. They're quite chaotic at times. It's never dull. The big gigs are, um, I'm name dropping here, but I met Mike Rutherford from Genesis. Mm. And um, I'd seen them supporting Free. I said, hello, Mike. I saw you supporting Free on Eel Pie Island in 1969. Dip boy, because he's very posh, you know. <laughs> Dip boy, did you really? You know, I said, yeah. And he said, you know, those are the gigs that are in black and white for me. He said, I remember we got seven pounds for the show. And for some reason, the microphone ended up in the River Thames. And he said, yeah, he said, once we got big, you know, it's just all sort of merged into one big thing. And I said, um, is how, how it works out? I said, I'm the bass player in Status Quo. He said, dear boy, I know who you are. That <laughs> <laughs> was really, you know, oh. The range of material that you've played on over the last 50 years, even not covering Quo, what more do you want? I mean, you know, I've lived a life. I've exceeded my wildest dreams. I got in the best band I could possibly be in in status quo. I can't tell you how much it's meant to me to be in that band. I wouldn't want to be in any other band. Now, this is where I belong. I really do think it is. And, and when it finishes, that's, fair, you know, fine. I still do John and Milo Edwards and Milo's Adventure and stuff. But when Quo finishes that, if another band was to offer me, ask me to go and join them, I'd say no. I'm not interested. I pushed all the buttons with Quo. Well, it's been amazing to talk to you, and uh, yeah, and thank you so much. My pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, then. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Strange Brew podcast. If you do like the show, please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online. It's 10 years since I started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time. All your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests. To support me, just go to thestrangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the homepage. Thank you very much. Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.